Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. How do I know that? Because Jesus had to die in order to relieve me fully from the penalty of sin, which is death. We are all going to die in this room because of sin. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter how well you take care of yourself. It's going to happen. Either that or the Lord returns and raptures us. Comfort one another with these words. Why? Because death is not good. It is a consequence of doing what I want rather than what God has commanded me to do. Somehow my way got better. It spoke a higher authority than what he has to say. So death is the problem in here. Sin is the problem. There is no worldly philosophy, thinking, or anything that you can bring to the table in order to make sense of it. It is written. The first thing that Jesus does is reaches for Scripture. Does everybody get this? I know I'm making a big deal out of what seems very simple. It is written, and look what he says. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Stop. Does your stomach believe that? I don't want to know if you believe that or you believe that in your heart. I want to know where your stomach's at. So you're looking at your wife right now because you had a skimpy breakfast. <laughs> Some of you are tapping hard on the shoulder. And, hey, man, are those donuts back there? Okay, save me one when I get out of here. Some of you wonder how long I'm going to preach just because you're hungry. Don't pre- yeah, Amen. Thank you. Wow. Wow. The Lord bless you and keep you too, right? Think about it. Our stomachs control a lot. But notice, Jesus says, hold on. Let me tell you what God has to say about this. You and I... Anyone who is created, now notice, Jesus doesn't lie, does he? So everything he's telling you and I is true, whether we believe it or not. That's important to understand. Watch this. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And what's interesting is this word here is not logos, like we saw in John 1. It is the Greek word rhema. It actually means audibly spoken is the idea. The audible word of God is the difference here. What in the world is Jesus saying? Turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself. It's been 40 days. It's been 40 nights. You are very hungry. So therefore, if you are God's son, use your authority and your ability and your power. Notice that Satan doesn't think it's anything different for Jesus to be God. Notice that use what God can use to do these things and do these things. Or let's look at it from another perspective. Remove yourself out from under the authority of the Father and satisfy yourself. Your flesh is lusting for it. Is this not the first category of sin, the lust of the flesh? It's what your body desperately wants. Why not give it to it? Why not take means into your own hands and do what you've got to do in order to take for yourself? Here's the reason why, Satan, is because that's not my sustenance. That's not why I live. That's not who controls whether I breathe or not. My stomach is not my God. Everybody get that? My stomach is not my God. God is my God. God determines whether I live or breathe. If God wants to bring me bread, he will. And if he doesn't want me to have it, he won't. Do we really believe that? Because here's what you do. Is when you think about where your stomach is, and you think about what Jesus is telling you, you start to realize the distance between belief and unbelief. Does everybody see that? 
That's a difference maker right there. How much do I truly trust that God will provide for me, that he is my sustainer, that what he says is what holds me up? That type of stuff will put Hershey's out of business. Does everybody see that? Do we really believe that about God's word? Because here's one thing we definitely know, Jesus did. And Jesus had no problem taking that and putting it out there. In fact, does everybody see where this is quoted from? Does anybody see the verse reference? Where's it quoted from? Deuteronomy, of all places. How dare he go into the Old Testament in a book that I never read and pull something out in order to fight Satan? Good grief. In fact, here's one thing. Spoiler, people. The other two responses he gives, those are from Deuteronomy as well. Jesus loved the book of Deuteronomy. So notice he uses that there too. Look what he says. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. That is not his source. Notice, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Get this. If temptation is a supernatural struggle, you have to draw from a supernatural source in order to have a supernatural strength to withstand it. Does everybody get this? It's important for you to know. It's in your notes. You don't have to write it down, but it's important. I thought a lot about it. Give me some kudos for crafting that, okay? In order to fight a supernatural temptation like this, you have got to draw from something greater than yourself. Why is that? Because we do not have the capacity to handle it. We have no problem flipping through the pages of Scripture and finding sinner, 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 sinner. And if the Bible continued on past Revelation, you can guarantee that all of our names would be in there as sinners who failed in some way before God. Why? Because a lot of times we try to take up these processes of our own flesh. But I didn't commit that sin. Is that what keeps you sinless? Just because you didn't do it? If you're Catholic, maybe. Oh, that hurt. But I didn't do that. You're free. You're clear. What does Jesus say? If you even look on a woman with lust, save your cab fare. You've already committed adultery in your heart. If you hate your brother, you have killed him. You don't need a knife. You just need self to slay another person. Everybody see that? Jesus is getting beyond what I do here or there. Jesus wants us to look at this. Do I really believe that what God has spoken sustains me in this situation? Do I really truly trust in that? Am I willing to lean into that as being factual? I didn't commit the sin. Well, you didn't commit that sin but you still sinned. Why? Because I had a better way to get out of it. Well, I devised a better plan. Well, I thought of a better answer. Well, I was able to talk my way out without really technically lying about it because I'm really sly and sneaky and I've developed it for a long time because I'm a big sinner. That's us. That's us. That's us. Finding the loophole so that somehow we can be convinced that we're not guilty. Get this. If what Jesus said here is true, any answer that we give apart from God's word being the foundation is a sin. It may not be this direct sin you were being tempted with, but you gave an answer other than it is written, which means I have written, or I've heard it said, or Gandhi had a good quote, or Oprah gave me this. Whatever. How'd that woman get so powerful? Because she gave a lot of free stuff away. She had a lot of good advice. Well, my guests are just the best. I don't know. But somehow people draw her. And I've heard it being said before, just walking through a store or something. Oh, well, on Oprah the other day, she said this. And people base their decisions. Oprah also has hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a lot easier to make other people's decisions when you've got that kind of money. You tell anybody what they want to hear. 
But when the temptation comes, are we, as Christians, who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, who have been set apart as saints of God and fully adopted into his family, and have a position of spotless righteousness in the eyes of the Father because he sees us through the glasses of the perfect death and resurrection of his Son, are we allowing our first words to be in a temptation? It is written. God has a better answer to say than doing this. Notice Jesus' second move. Or sorry, Satan's second move. Number two, notice the first one is the lust of the flesh. Number two, the devil took him into the holy city. Where's that? Jerusalem, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the pinnacle of the temple was about 300 to 350 feet high. So they're standing up here, and they're looking out over what is the Kidron Valley. I believe it's the southwest side. And looking on there, and he said, If you are the Son of God, notice the same approach. Throw yourself down. Jump. For it is written. Uh Uh-oh. Can Satan use Scripture? Yes, he can. He can use it like a billy club. He'll beat you with it. He'll do like this to get you into sin. And then once you've committed it, he'll do this. And he will twist Scripture to get it to happen. Now, here's the amazing thing. A lot of people have thought that his quotation of Scripture here is the deception because he leaves a little portion out. It's not. It is not uncommon throughout the New Testament for writers to be quoting from the Old Testament and omit a certain little portion there. That's not out of the ordinary for how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. But watch what happens. It is written, he will command his angels concerning you and... On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus, throw yourself off here because God has said in the Old Testament that the angels will keep you from hitting the ground. Now, you're 350 feet up, and yes, perfectly God, but also perfectly man. And you jump. What happens if you hit? Dead. Splat. Are the angels going to come in and rescue that? What does the word say? Satan quoted it. See, it's odd, isn't it? How does Jesus answer it? Watch what happens. Jesus said, uh, sorry, yeah, Jesus said to him on the hand, what's he say? It is written, quoted from Deuteronomy 6.16, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here's what Satan is saying, Jesus, in the Old Testament, it seems pretty clear that if you were to do something to put your body in jeopardy, God's not going to let anything happen to you. And so if that's the case, let's see if he's telling the truth. In other words, Jesus putting himself in peril, in mortal danger, in order to force God's hand to prove what has already been said. Let me ask you a question. Does God owe us an explanation about anything? No. Is he required to prove his word to anyone? No. The one thing I love about skeptics of God's word is they can never tell me where it's wrong. They want to tell me that it's wrong, but they can't tell me where it's wrong. God is not obligated to prove anything. And so what is Jesus' response? We're not to test God. We're not to put our lives in some sort of mortal danger in order to ask the question, will God show up? In other words, taking your life for yourself is sin. This is the boastful pride of life. This is that category of sin. It is saying, God, let's see what you'll do here. I dare you. Anybody want to take those steps with God? Notice that Jesus doesn't either. He says here, verse. Eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. Now, obviously higher than 350 feet. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Not just what they look like, but also what they reigned over, the power that constituted them, and all of the accolades that they received because of their Dominion. Anytime that you bring in the idea of a kingdom, you are talking about domination and rulership. So think of this. Satan takes him up and he's able to see all of them all across the world. Watch. 
And he said to him, all these things I will give you. Stop there. Is this a bona fide offer? Why? Why would you say such a thing? Because I'll tell you this, I don't agree with you. Oh, nobody wants to talk now. (laughs) Why is this not a bona fide offer? Because we're what? They're not his to give? Oh. Yeah, that, it, uh, dude, dude, I love it. It sounds like somebody threw a speaking spell down the stairs. That's great. Beep, 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 beep. Satan is the god of this world, the prince of this present age. See, here's the interesting thing. When Adam and Eve sinned, they forfeited the right to have dominion. When they forfeited it, Satan took up the mantle. And this is why all the world powers spiritually speaking, are controlled by little g gods, also known as demons. This is why what we're dealing with is not just what ended up on the front page of the news or whether or not CNN is broadcasting fake news. All of this thing is demonically motivated and originated. Oh, I'm not comfortable with that. That's fine. It takes a while to grab a hold of, but it's reality. Satan is over this world system. He has orchestrated it perfectly, and all people care about is money and power. Don't be deceived. Do not, if this sounds familiar, do not love the world or the things of the world. Doesn't matter if it's got an elephant or donkey next to it. Doesn't matter if you're for the Second Amendment or against it. Demonic forces are behind all of it. Let me give you these references real quick. They're in your notes, but let me give them to you. John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Ephesians 2, 2, 1 John 5, 19. All of them speak of Satan having the dominance, the reign, the rule at this present time, though it's temporary, over this earth. So if he is running this show down here and leading people astray by making them care about things other than what God has put forward in his word that we should be most concerned about, be guaranteed he has every right at this moment to say, Jesus, I will give you the kingdoms of the world if, what's the condition? Look what it says. I will give you all the kingdoms of the world, all of these I will give you if, You fall down and worship me. There's the exchange. Sin's always got an exchange, doesn't it? But if you just give up a little bit of this, you'll get a whole lot of this. Notice that the idea here is, number one, are all the kingdoms going to be Jesus's? Are they going to be his in the end? I mean, when we read through Daniel chapter 2, we talk about the statue, and we talk about the huge rock that was made, that was not cut with hands, that comes in and smashes the feet of this statue and puts them into dust, and it is established, and it will never pass away. It is an everlasting kingdom. When we talk about that prophecy, we're talking about the kingdom of Christ. When he returns in Revelation 19, he rips through the sky and destroys everyone who is opposed to him. He then sets up his kingdom, and he rules the world, physically, literally, politically, at that moment. So they're all going to be his. However, Satan's offering them now. Let me ask you a question. You ever thought about what would happen if Jesus took this offer? Right? Come on, Merv, let's make a deal, right? Door number two, give me the kingdoms now, and I'll just get down on this knee and say, hey, Satan. What's up? That was Monty? Who was Merv on then? Yeah, Merv owned it all, probably. (laughs) That's probably why I saw his name on there. That was Monty. Okay. Well, I've been corrected today. That hurts. All right. But what would have happened if Jesus would have taken that deal? Let me ask you a question. If he bowed down to Satan, who's in charge? Uh Uh-oh. He couldn't be our Savior because then he would have sinned and he couldn't have died for the sins of the world. What does that mean for you and me? Hey, let's say it in no uncertain terms. Damned. All of us without hope. All of us. So there's a lot riding on this decision. What if that was offered to you? All the kingdoms of the world and its glory. If you will simply bow a knee and worship the devil. We think, how come everybody's so silent? 
this is satanic stuff we're talking about today. Yes, it is. Because that's our enemy. Know your enemy and know how to fight him. And Jesus is teaching us. Notice, the extent of his temptation has no bounds. He will go as far as to try to offer all that he possesses control over in exchange for this one moment. And I love it because Jesus has no problem. Look what he says. Jesus said to him, go, Satan. Or some of your translations say, be gone, Satan. It is what? Here's what God's word has to say about the situation. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him what? Only. And here's the reason why. is because the one that has your affection is the one that determines your direction. That is the reason why. You are to worship the Lord your God only, alone, period. No one else has precedence. No one else has control. No one else has directives or words to say that matter. Isn't this the essence of unbelief when somehow we think that something else has gained a greater authority or that we should pay more attention to rather than what God has said? Is that how Eve fell? Yes? No? Who's asleep? Okay, just one of you. Okay. Is that not what happened to Eve? It is what happened to Eve. All it took was a moment. Did God really say? Did he really say? You know, the one who created language, did he have mumble mouth at that moment? Was he not clear? Oh, yeah, we're not supposed to eat it or touch it. Did he ever say don't touch it? No, but Satan knew at that moment that he had gotten her off the path. How should have Eve responded? It is written. It is written. And noticed here, by showing Jesus all these kingdoms, took him up to a place where he could see it all, the lust of the eyes. Don't you want this? Some, sometimes some preachers call this the eye gate. This is where sin enters in at from what you see and that it originates in the heart wants to draw you away. Now here's the amazing thing. Where did Eve fall? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Everything on told us, right? Where does Jesus succeed? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes boastful pride of life. In other words, let's say it this way. Every area where you and I fail, Jesus is victorious. And here's the amazing thing. Because of the type of relationship he has made available through his death and resurrection, if you are a believer in Christ, you are already victorious over these things just by identification with him. That's everything that Romans chapter 6 is about. You have died to sin. You are alive in Christ. And so if that's the case, present your instruments as instruments of righteousness. In other words, you don't have to commit sin because Jesus has already overcome it and then died for it and removed it from your account. Does that make sense? Now notice, that's from a positional aspect in God's sight. You and I have no sin if we are in Christ. That's pretty cool. How come nobody says amen to that? Are we so Bible that we can't be a little Baptist? I mean, you guys all sit in the same place like Baptists. Come on. But think about it. In God's sight, I have no sin. All God's people said, what? No, said, what? You can say amen, but first let's get the reality of it. What? No sin, but he saw what I did this morning. Yeah, no sin. Why do you confess that? Yes, you do, but not to be accepted by him. You are already fully accepted in Christ. (laughs) Now you're doing it out of obligation. So here's some things I want to point out about how do we apply what we see Jesus doing in these three categories of sin. Number one, Jesus always uses what? Scripture. How do I fight temptation? There's only one answer to this. It's real simple. It's hard to remember in the moment. 
gets tense, start to sweat and get a little flush. You can feel the sweat coming out of your pores or something. Oh my gosh, what am I near here? Start biting your, your nails like a typewriter, right? Scripture. The answer is scripture. God has something to say about this temptation, and I need to know what it is in order to address it effectively and squash it. Does that make sense? It's got to get dealt with. So I've got to use the word. Now, hold on. If I have to use the word in order to fight temptation, that means I need to what? I need to know the word. We are commanded. We are commanded. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you. How? Richly, we know the verse. It is supposed to find its residence within you and I. Why? So when the temptation comes, we can immediately, it is written this, it is written this. And we deal with it according to God's truth. Any other method you try to use, it is insufficient. And you will be drawn into sin, and you will sin by not giving the right answer. Does that make sense? There is no other solution but Scripture. Here's the third thing I think a lot of people miss. Did everybody notice that Jesus didn't stop and pray? Does everybody notice that? Does that seem odd to you? Well, Jesus, if you're hungry, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Uh, Hold on. Father in heaven, does he do that? Why not? Why does Jesus not pray? I mean, are we supposed to pray without ceasing and in all occasions pray and, right? Command men to lift up holy hands, that kind of thing. Is that right? Why doesn't Jesus pray? I mean, of all the people that are going, he's setting the model example of how you and I fight temptation so that it doesn't give way to sin, so that it doesn't ultimately lead to death, and so that we can remain in a fellowship context with the Father where that intimacy is not broken. Where is prayer? Where? Why doesn't he pray? Blah, 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 blah. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. What do you think, Jamie? Using scripture as prayer? Mm, That sounds spiritual. What do you think? What? He's already in communication with the Father? Hey, I I have a hotline to the Lord. Now, hold on a second, because I'm getting ready to do something that could be extremely dangerous to my personal character. My mom and dad are here. (laughs) And my dad wants to answer the question. Should I let him? See, uh, (sighs) and when he does, you guys are going to know who he is. And then it's just all downhill for me, I can tell. Go ahead, Dad. He already knows God's will on the matter. Does Jesus need to pray? I mean, we see where he does pray, right? He goes up on the mountain to pray for the disciples who's going to be chosen to follow him and all those things. But in this temptation situation, do you need to pray about the temptation? You don't. If we spend time praying about the temptation, a lot of times it's because we're trying to rationalize how to still be okay getting away with the sin and moving on. Let's be honest. We're evil people. Let's not underestimate ourselves. That's why we need a Savior to begin with. But notice, when you address it like Jesus says to address it, the temptation comes, no. I use the same sword every time and deal with it. Get it done. Slay it. Choose God's word over sin. It doesn't get any more simple than that. Hard to implement. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you throughout this next week if you have the opportunity. Again, the whole reason why I... I did 11 and a half pages of notes this week. It's so that you can go over it and reflect upon it throughout the week and meditate on this. One of the greatest problems that preachers have about the Sunday sermon, and I'm sure Pastor Steve can agree with this, is sometimes we feel like we've studied all week and we've poured a lot of time into this, and then we dispense it on Sunday, and it's almost like the wind came across and just blew it away out to the lake. And it's drowned never to be remembered anymore. No, that's our sin, not the sermon, right? So the idea is, is that if we would meditate on these truths, don't worry so much about what I say, but get in the word with this. 
and let it renew your mind so that when temptation comes, the first thing you're grabbing for is not being quick to answer it according to how we think things ought to be. It is so that God's word is handy and you are nimble in drawing it to address it. Does that make sense? If you have difficulty reading through these, you're like, man, this is forever. Listen to it on the, on the website, gbcportage.com. You can go there, click on sermons, and there it is. Did that answer your question? Go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the whole attitude of prayer is never to leave us. That's important. The attitude of prayer is always to be constant. But in a temptation situation, that's not when you stop and pray. That's when you slay it. That's when you address it. That's when you fight as Jesus teaches us how to fight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you, God, that you give us very clearly through the model of your son, how do you deal with sin? And what it does is it further um, uh, bolsters our confidence in the fact that he is able to deal with with our sin. He is a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. He can meet us in our failures, Lord. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for giving us everything that we would need as an arsenal to be able to address every temptation that faces us. Father, help us to be diligent in knowing it and diligent in addressing temptation when it comes our way. Maybe we're thinking through areas where we have failed in the past few hours or or the past week. Maybe we're thinking upon situations that were so devastating to our life that if we would have known the scriptures at that time, we could have addressed it and things would have been much differently. Father, let those be teaching moments that humble us and that extol your word for being what sustains us. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the living God. So I pray, Lord, if we are not convinced of this, help our unbelief to trust you fully. We pray it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.